All right, thank you very much. My name is Trevor Joseph. I work for the California Department of Water Resources. Today's webinar is a public comment opportunity for the draft Groundwater Sustainability Plan Emergency Regulations. Today I'm here with some DWR staff including Dan McManus, Stephen Springhorn, and Tim Godwin. The purpose of this meeting, as I mentioned, is to hear public comments on the draft GSP, as it will be referred to, emergency regulations. Before we get started, we have approximately a 20-minute PowerPoint presentation designed to give an overview of the draft GSP emergency regulations. After that comment period, excuse me, after that presentation, we will open up the uh, webinar for comments or, or excuse me questions on that presentation on Sigma um, and on the implementation of the groundwater sustainability program after those questions are addressed we will transition to the actual public comment portion of today's um, webinar so with that I'll turn it over to Tanya our facilitator and she'll walk us through some procedural um, requirements Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tanya Carlone. I'm a facilitator with the Center for Collaborative Policy based out of Sacramento State University. I am here with my colleague, Stephanie Horry, who is operating today's webinar. I'd like to just go ahead and take us through the um, agenda as uh, I, well, Trevor basically did that. Uh, we will be, I'll just reiterate very quickly that af after the presentation, um, from DWR, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of clarification. Um, and I'll talk to you in a moment about how you submit those questions. And those are specifically related to any clarifying questions you might have about the process or the regulations or anything that Trevor may have discussed in his presentation. After we spend approximately 30 minutes on your questions, we will move to a public comment period and I'll tell you how you can, on this webinar, uh, provide your comments today. Um, so let's talk about, let me give you some formal language, since this is the public, um, uh, this is uh, the formal rulemaking process for the GSP regulations. We convene here today, March 24th, at 1 p.m. to receive public comments on a proposed rulemaking action by the Department of Water Resources. Today's public meeting is scheduled to conclude at 3 p.m. The department has proposed changes to the California Code of Regulations, Title 23, Division 2, Chapter 1.5, commencing with Section 350. We will refer to this regulation as the GSP and ALT regulation. Some webinar details, the, the um, webinar is being recorded and will be made available at the Sustainable Groundwater Management Program website, and that will occur very soon, and there's the link to, to um, the website. You will also find exhibits um, that will be useful for you if you haven't already seen them at the DSET, um, Sustainable Groundwater Management website. Exhibit A is the text of the draft GSP and ALT regulation. There are other supporting documents there, including the draft GSP emergency regulations guide, which is a helpful tool um, and an abridged version. It does not replace the draft GSP regs, but um, hopefully you will find that very beneficial. You can find that on the website as well with many other materials. Let's talk about how you can submit comments on the webinar today. Your oral comments will be made in the order submitted in the question box on your webinar tool. Uh, uh, let me distinguish between how we're going to handle your questions of clarification. Um, after the presentation, we will ask you to type those questions in. We'll be taking those in writing. But when we get to the public comment period, we will be asking you to make those those um, oral comments. In order for you to submit them, you must follow these instructions. First, make sure you have entered the audio PIN number on your control panel. Um, you'll need to submit, um, include that, have, have keyed that in, um, in order for us to, to hear you. When you do make your comments, and I'm going to repeat this, so don't worry. Uh, when you do make your oral comments, um, the speaker will please type in your name, your affiliation, 
and a brief topic description, including the page number and the article, if you have it. If you don't, don't, don't worry. You don't have to thumb through the, the regulations right now to find that. If you have it, it'll just um, make it uh, simplify the process for us on our end. I will repeat these instructions when we get to both the questions for clarification and the, the um, public comment period. The department will accept public comment only and will not respond. Again, I'd like to distinguish this is for the, the formal public comment period. The department will respond to your questions for clarification. But when we get to the formal public comment period, um, the, the department will not respond to any com comments and testimonies made during that portion of the meeting. Oral comments should be addressed to the department, should be relevant to this proposed GSP and ALT regulation, and should be made professionally and respectfully. The department will impose a time limit of approximately three minutes today. And now Trevor will, will make the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. So the purpose of today's presentation is to provide a, a very brief overview of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, focus then in on the draft emergency regulations, a summary of that and the process. And what I'll be using for the presentation is essentially items from the guide that Tanya mentioned. If you haven't had a chance already, please see that guide on our website as it's a good layperson guide to the draft regulations. And then finally moving to next steps. So SIGMA background. As most of you know, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was signed on September of 2014. Um, the governor had a quote here at the signing of the uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and I'll mention that here. A central feature of these bills is the recognition that the groundwater management in California is best accomplished locally. And why I bring that up is really this is kind of our overarching guide or principle that the department used when developing these draft regulations. There are also some, uh, some other key principles that I'd like to describe briefly. One, that groundwater needs to be managed sustainably. Two, the local agencies need the necessary authority and tools in order to do so. And then three, state assistance and oversight. And then intervention should only be needed um, um, if local agencies are unsuccessful. So the, the major roles and responsibilities identified in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act are listed here. So the Department of Water Resources, the department I work for, we are developing the draft regulations. I've developed the draft regulations and providing uh, technical assistance. The State Water Resources Control Board is that intervention agency, the enforcing agency, if local agencies are unsuccessful in meeting the sustainable groundwater management goals. Local agencies are now required to develop groundwater sustainability agencies or form into groundwater sustainability agencies if they are going to prepare groundwater sustainability plans. And of course, these entities will be conducting the development and implementation of these groundwater sustainability plans. The department had a lot of activities and projects identified in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act fairly early on in the implementation of the act, and they are listed here. Um, we've completed a series of projects to date. Of course, we're here today to hear public comments on the draft sustainability plan um, and alternative regulations. So where does SIGMA apply? SIGMA applies in the high and medium priority basins shown here in orange and yellow. There are 127 high and medium priority basins. The groundwater sustainability plans, uh, the requirement for the department is by June 1st of 2016, the department shall adopt regulations for the evaluation of groundwater sustainability plans and alternatives, the implementation of those plans and alternatives, and coordination agreements. So our process in order to complete this project of developing emergency regulations is shown here. This is a four phase process that we used. Early last year, we um, conducted some scoping in terms of identifying the issues in, in a series of advisory group stakeholders um, in order to start the, the project. During the second phase, we developed a series of 10 framework documents 
discussing, uh, used to discuss those issues with the advisory groups. This third phase that we're, we're close to closing out, we've drafted emergency regulations. We're having these required public meetings this week and that comment period to hear comments on these draft regulations will close April 1st. And then we'll move into the final phase shown on the far right, adopting emergency regulations, which again need to be adopted by June 1st of 2016. Our communication and outreach process is shown here. We've had a series of advisor groups that we've been meeting with to discuss the issues and challenges associated with this project and the development of these regulations. In addition, we've had one-on-one -on -one meetings with organizations, agencies, tribal government, uh, federal agencies. We've had more than 60 meetings alone with our advisor groups over this last year. So now I'll move to the draft regulations, again, using that guide that I mentioned that's on our website. This is another four-phase process, not to be confused with the four phases of how we've implemented the project, but these phases are really designed to explain how the regulation will be implemented by local agencies or from the local agency perspective. So before I get into the actual phases, let me start with Article 1 of the Draft Emergency Regulations, the introductory provisions. So the introductory provisions of our Draft Emergency Regulations specify the components of the groundwater sustainability plans and alternatives and the coordination agreements that are going to be um, evaluated by the department. Specifically, the methodology and criteria that the department will use to evaluate these plans, alternatives, and coordination agreements. Within Article 1, we have a series of general principles. I'll just highlight a few quickly. One is that a Groundwater Sustainability Plan, the GSA, must achieve the sustainability goal for the entire basin in a 20-year time period. Groundwater Sustainability Plans should not adversely affect an adjacent basin. Groundwater Sustainability Plans um, should also include a description of how basin-wide governance will be developed to achieve sustainability and establish a timeline for filling uh, data gaps. And there are additional general principles provided within our regulations. This is a little hard to see at this scale, I recognize, but this is a graphic that is in our guide that describes the four phases through a flowchart as shown on kind of the top bar, if you will, the horizontal bar across the top. Um, how this flowchart works and this diagram works is the middle bar, if you will, describes how where each of the articles within the draft regulations fits within the process identified above. And then finally, the bottom of this graphic depicts the major milestones that local agencies um, will need to um, consider when implementing the regulations. This includes other items outside of the regulations, but related to groundwater sustainability planning, and that includes best management practices, basin boundary modifications, and this groundwater sustainability agency formation requirement. So let's focus first on phase one, GSA formation and coordination. So GSA formation is actually not required in the draft emergency regulations. That is a requirement in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And so provided here is just a quick status update of GSA formation as of um, this month. Specifically, there's been 69 separate GSA formation notices that have been submitted to the department. Currently, there are 49. There are, there are overlapping service area boundaries. This overlap will need to be reconciled by June 30th of 2017 in order for GSAs to be exclusive GSAs for the purposes of implementing, developing and implementing groundwater sustainability plans. As shown on the graphic on the right, um, the lighter blue is the exclusive or GSAs that have been submitted. The dark, uh, darker colors, purple, is where there is currently overlapping GSA notifications. And finally, the yellow is uh, existing adjudicated regions. 
So really the article of the draft GSP regulations. Um, excuse me, Trevor. Um, excuse me, everyone. We're going to pause the webinar for just a moment um, to deal with a technical issue. We'll be back in a moment. Thank you so much for, um, for your patience with that interruption. We've, um, there are various people who have not been able to yet get on to the webinar today, but who are able to call in and listen by phone. For those of you in that situation, we're working to get you a PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation. So you can expect to, if you've emailed Stephanie Horry, you can expect to receive that directly from her. Thank you again for, for your patience with, with some of these technical difficulties. I'm going to hand it back to Trevor. All right, thank you. So within phase one, really the draft regulation um, article that relates to GSA formation and coordination is actually the coordination agreement requirement. So this requirement describes both voluntary coordination and mandatory coordination between agencies, and I'll describe that in more detail here. So there's two types of coordination identified in the draft emergency regulations. One is interbasin coordination with an E. Um, this is an optional requirement and it's illustrated on the top right. And this is coordination between two hydraulically connected basins or subbasins. Again, this is an optional requirement but is strongly recommended by the department and there's a series of requirements uh, in the draft emergency regulations. The bottom coordination, intra-basin coordination, is when there are multiple GSAs preparing multiple GSPs in the same basin or sub-basin. This is a mandatory requirement that's clearly identified in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And again, the draft regulations outline the specific requirements within intra-basin coordination, including identification of a coordinating agency. Let's move to phase two, GSA preparation and submission. There's a series of articles initially in, at the beginning of, of this phase, article three and four, technical and reporting standards and procedures. And what I want to mention here is that these articles are a little more detailed in nature um, in terms of a standard process and requirements that the department needs to evaluate plans um, and the multitude of plans that the department will receive um, for evaluation. So generally, these two articles are a little more prescriptive in nature in terms of the specific requirements the department needs to see. So for Article 3, Technical and Reporting Standards, uh, there is a requirement for best management practices to be followed, data and reporting standards, data management and record keeping. For procedurals, there is information that needs to be provided to the department, reporting provisions, an initial notification required by the GSA, and public comment requirements. Plan content is really kind of the heart of the draft regulations, and this includes a series of, of sub-articles. Within plan content, there's the series of five sub-articles listed here. One thing I would like to point out is the um, undesirable results that are described or illustrated at the bottom of the slide um, identified as uh, significant and reasonable when there's uh, chronic lowering of groundwater levels, reduction of storage, storage, seawater intrusion, degraded water quality, land subsidence, and surface water depletion. These have been identified or described in the draft regulations as critical parameters. And the reason we've used that term is that we didn't want to repeat all six of these uh, in name every time we need to reference these six um, parameters. 
And the reason we're calling them critical parameters is they're actually not significant and reasonable unless they've passed a, a threshold that, that uh, causes significant and unreasonable conditions. Um, and so why I bring this up is many of the sub-articles described here on this slide really need to be um, evaluated and um, thought through these critical parameters, kind of through the lens of these critical parameters. So let me start out with uh, article, sub-article one, administrative information. This is really the, the where and the who, a description of the plan area and the agency uh, who is going to uh, be uh, developing and implementing the GSP. Basin setting is really the current and projected conditions in the basin. Again, kind of through the lens of those critical parameters described at the bottom. There is a little bit more prescriptiveness in terms of the basin setting requirements in order for the department to evaluate these uh, multitude of groundwater sustainability plans that the department will receive. Where the department's approach the regulations in terms of local agency flexibility is really through the remaining uh, three sub-articles here. The sustainable groundwater management criteria, this is really the what and the when in terms of the description analysis of what sustainable groundwater management looks like in a given basin or sub-basin, and then when it will be achieved. And this I mentioned is more flexible as the requirements are likely going to look very, or the, the specific approach that agencies will use in order to establish the requirements in sub-article three will vary greatly depending upon the unique setting of the basin or sub-basin, the stakeholder issues, um, and, and land use, et cetera. Monitoring network and projects and actions, really this is kind of the how, if you will. This is a description of, for the monitoring networks, how uh, groundwater will be measured, and projects and actions is really a description of how uh, sustainable groundwater management will be achieved through these projects and actions if, if uh, sustainable groundwater management isn't already uh, occurring in the basin. A lot of detail here uh, on, on this slide in the draft for emergency regulations. So moving on to phase three GSP review and evaluation. The applicable articles in the draft regulations to, for this phase is really the evaluation and assessment that the department will do of these groundwater sustainability plans and alternatives. So specifically, we have methodology and criteria that the department will use um, described here. There are some procedural items uh, listed here in terms of the department's going to post GSPs on our website within 20 days. Um, we're going to evaluate groundwater sustainability plans within two years of, of receiving those plans. The department makes a determination of plan adequacy and alternative adequacy. And then we may identify deficiencies in those plans and, and may rec recommend corrective actions. Again, all of this is described within this article. So what the evaluation and assessment criteria looks like is illustrated on this slide. I'm going to advance the animation. So we will receive a GSP or an alternative as described currently in the draft regulations and there's a series of pass-fail criteria. You can think of this as the first step where we will simply either have the information or we won't. Examples of this is that a requirement in the pass-fail criteria is that the department must receive a plan within the um, timeline established in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. For most GSPs, that's either 2020 or 2022. And um, if we do not receive it within that time frame, that, that's an automatic uh, failure. Same thing applies for basin-wide coverage. The department must receive either one GSP or multiple GSPs that cover the entire basin or sub-basin with the exception of uh, a alternative or a new adjudication or existing adjudication. And again, that's an example of pass-fail criteria. There are other pass-fail criteria listed in the draft regulations. So moving to step two, this is the substantial compliance or adequacy criteria. So here there's currently 11 um, criteria uh, in the draft emergency regulations. And the department will look at this evaluation criteria 
in order to determine whether or not a plan is, again, um, potentially deficient and in, in, inadequate and subject to state board intervention. It's possible that there might be minor um, uh, um, details that are not covered in the plan and the department may make a conditionally adequate determination giving the JSA a um, limited amount of time uh, to address those those deficiencies uh, which would either then um, cause either an adequate determination or inadequate determination by the department. Um, and finally, if, if the evaluation criteria, substantial compliance criteria is um, supported, then, then there would be no deficiencies in that plan and it would simply be an adequate determination on, on the behalf of the department. So moving to slide 32, um, Article 9 has to deal with alternatives and adjudicated areas. So th this really refers to the series of, um, I'm going to call them options, if you will, identified in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act for alternatives to GSPs, how the department will evaluate these alternatives, and uh, the specific requirements for these alternatives. So finally, phase four, implementation reporting. Within this phase, as it relates to the draft emergency regulations, is Article 7, reports, assessments, and amendments. This is really about the local agency or GSA's responsibility to provide annual reports. The department's review of this, re, these annual reports, the agency's responsibility to evaluate and reassess their GSPs for effective modifications to those plans. So moving to slides 35 and 36, next steps. So this is the third of four public meetings uh, to consider public comments on these draft emergency regulations. The final meeting will be tomorrow in Sacramento at, at 9 a.m. The public comment period now closes on April 1st. We extended that public comment period uh, to April 1st a, a few weeks ago. April 20th, we hope to be in front of the California Water Commission summarizing the public comments that we've received and potentially providing some um, of our uh, proposed revisions to the draft emergency regulation. And then finally, in May, we hope to be back in front of the California Water Commission with a draft final dra regulation for the commission's consideration of adoption. And then again, June 1st is our uh, legislative deadline for adopting these emergency regulations. So with that, I want to thank you for um, being part of this uh, uh, public comment uh, webinar today. Um, we are, here's some information in terms of our, our websites. Um, but uh, as Tanya mentioned, the first part now, we're transitioning into just questions you have as it relates to what I presented today or questions on the draft emergency regulations. Um, after we close out that question and answer process, we will then transition to public comments. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. So what we're going to do for this, questions, uh, this question period, this question and answer period, is ask you to submit any questions that you may have in writing in the question box. We will not be taking oral questions at this time. We'll do that for the public comment period. So please, if you have a question, please submit that. Uh, we may receive more questions than we can answer, so realize that we have DWR staff here looking at representative questions and doing their best to, um, to answer as many as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tim Godwin, who will be leading this question period. So uh, we have the first question. And uh, I'll, I'll read it verbatim. There's actually several questions within this. It's a great clarification point. If a subbasin has multiple GSAs and multiple GSPs with a coordination or with a coordinated agreement, how is basin defined in the new regulations? Maybe respond to that. So this is Stephen. Uh, the way that we're handling that is the regulations point back to the sigma definitions that are in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and that definition is that a basin can be either a 
a basin or sub-basin as defined in Bulletin 118. So that is something to consider when reviewing these regulations that the definitions in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act are also used for these regulations. Okay, so as a follow-on here, also is each GSP within the sub-basin required, required to report and document items for the entire basin or just for their portion of the sub-basin. Many items refer to the basin-wide reporting and analysis and not sure how this applies to ind individual GSPs in a multi-GSA GSP sub-basin. Sure. Hi, this is a Dan McManus, and and yeah, with the um, with the basins where you have multiple uh, GSAs and multiple GSPs, the idea is that you would um, you would need to provide that information for the basin as a whole, and and primarily that that refers right back to the statute, which recommends that the uh, the information is provided for the basin. So either and that would be either through that uh, coordinated document, you know, explaining that, or or through the um, actual GSP itself. So um, why don't we, uh, the next here is, uh, if I'm a grower, what do I need to know or do for this? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I think as a grower, um, you know, you, you might be interested certainly in which local agency is going to represent uh, your area as it relates to potentially forming a groundwater sustainability agency. Um, so you may be interested in um, tracking the GSA formation activities on the department's website uh, because, again, we post those uh, GSA uh, formation notifications on our website, and we also have an interactive map uh, that you can use to, um, you know, essentially input your um, street or home address, and it will uh, provide uh, your location as it relates to any uh, GSAs that have uh, uh, formed in your area. Because ultimately, you know, the, as pointed out previously, this groundwater is best accomplished locally, and it's the local agencies that will be obviously preparing these groundwater sustainability plans. Um, so really getting in touch with those entities is, 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 is probably in, in your best interest. Um. Okay, so why don't we dive into the next. Uh, what authority, if any, does a GSA have to act upon or enforce a GSP during the two-year review period that DWR has? So while, while, we're, while we're reviewing GSPs, um, what, how, what authority does the GSA, GSA have to enact the plan, implement the plan? Yeah, so I mean that that's a good question. I think you know it's really the um, within I think it's Chapter Five of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Uh, the GSA uh, should look at um, you know that uh, chapter specifically. Um, we, you know, the department when, after a plan is adopted, it can be submitted to the department for review and evaluation. And as I mentioned, we'll have two years, uh, up to two years to review that plan um, for adequacy. Um, you know, so it, the, the GSA um, should, should look at that chapter closely, but it um, can, can implement that uh, plan after it's adopted, even before we've uh, given it a technical review. So a clarifying uh, question regarding Sigma itself. Um, the question is, this is presented as an emergency. So when the emergency is over, what happens with all this new regulation? So the way that the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was passed was that these regulations are emergency regulations. And what that does is it is a, a different or streamlined process through regulation creation. And so the way that the statute has been written is that these regulations will remain emergency regulations in perpetuity. Okay. Um, so the next one is in regards to data. So um, it's understood that uh, 
they cannot use their own data um, that they spent you know much effort over several decades to collect and instead we must only use your data if any yeah hi uh, that's a good question and, and we've kind of heard that concern before but actually um, if you look in the, the regulations page 24 and I um, it, there is a provision at the end of the water budget sec section that does say the agency may utilize other data um, in addition to that provided by the department as long as they can demonstrate that the data is of sufficient quality. So you will be able to use your own data if, if you can demonstrate that, that it is of, of uh, equal or better quality. So uh, moving on, uh, how do we make sure that minimum thresholds and measurable objectives that are set by GSAs uh, for each critical parameter are acceptable to the department? Yeah, and so that's a good question. I mean, the um, this, as I mentioned briefly, that specifically in sub-article three of Article five, um, and you know, the, the the approach we've took taken with developing the draft regulations is to try to maximize local agency flexibility because we again we know that there is uh, different levels and um, ways that local agencies will need to manage uh, groundwater again because of the varied uh, different land use uh, types of, of, of uh, groundwater uh, uh, potential uh, issues, uh, stakeholder interests, um, and so on and so forth. So that requirement really in developing your minimum threshold and measurable objectives is to follow a framework of um, a, a series of, of items that we want to see in order to evaluate the, whether that's been done adequately. And that framework includes, and I'm just paraphrasing, but items such as, you know, establishing these minimum thresholds and measurable objectives, how are beneficial uses and users of water considered when establishing those. Uh, another uh, framework item is what um, what data was used in order to establish those those uh, frame that, that those levels? Uh, another item is how will they be measured um, into the future? And uh, with the minimum threshold requirement, if the minimum threshold is exceeded, what kind of effects will that cause in the basin? So th so the reality is we want to see essentially your homework, if you will, in terms of how you've approached establishing those minimum thresholds and measurable objectives. But each minimum threshold and measurable objective for our, for likely each GSA uh, and each GSP will be very different or different. Um, and so there, we, we, we recognize that and, um, and uh, it, it's really about going through the process uh, and showing us how you've uh, approached uh, the development of those thresholds and objectives. Thank you. Um, so with climate change, fundamental questions such as precipitation and snow cover will change over time. Therefore, a static plan may end up not achieving sustainability. How do the regulations address this issue of a static plan and changing climate? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Of course, you yeah, have quite a few things are going to change uh, into the future. And so under the water budget section uh, number three, when you're uh, doing your projected water budgets, you do have to uh, take into account the uh, uncertainty associated with the um, surface water supply reliability, the projection of future land use planning, um, population, and climate change. So we are asking that the GSAs uh, look at those uncertainties when projecting their water budgets. Uh, ask a, a general question here about GSAs. Um, what about regions that have no existing GSA governance, uh, i.e. white spaces out there? Um, no surface water provider, no drainage district, and outside municipality scope. There's an unwillingness uh, of the adjacent uh, GSA annexations. How, how do these white spaces get handled, I guess? So to some degree that will be up to the, how the board, the, the state board, how they handle that. They will be, um, it's, it's the county's, um, you know, responsibility to uh, take that over. But if the county actually notifies us that they will not be um, being the GSA for that area, then it would um, default to the state board and then they would determine how best to, uh, to manage that area. 
Um, a a follow-up to an earlier question here. Uh, what are the possible issues if the GSA acts on a GSP uh, after it is adopted but is then found to be inadequate by DWR? Does the department have a, a role here or is that a state board um, function? You know, how does this, how does this come together? As part of our technical assistance in the, the development of plans and GSPs at the local level, the department plans to be working closely with locals, local agencies and GSAs um, to be able to assist and provide some guidance as those GSPs are developing. So uh, oh, a, couple, a couple of questions that came in via email. Um, who determines what is measured and how it is measured? Uh, what, are the measure, are, what are the measurement standards, et cetera? Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll take that question in terms of um, the measurable objectives and you know, what is measured in order to achieve those objectives and the minimum thresholds. So you know, who determines how that's measured is the local agency. We want to hear from the local agency in terms of you know, what critical parameters the, that I mentioned briefly on that slide are um, in, in existence in their basin? At what point do they become significant and unreasonable? How they're going to measure and ultimately avoid any significant and unreasonable uh, levels as it relates to those critical parameters within the 20-year implementation horizon? So it's really up to the local agencies to, to explain where those thresholds are, where the objectives are, how they're going to measure it, and uh, submit that to the department. But the specific standards and some of the process as it relates to approaching that is also what I described up front in Article 3, the technical standards, because here the department needs to see uh, some of that in a standardized format in order for us to evaluate uh, adjacent plans, multiple plans within the same basin or sub-basin, um, so that, that that process and those standards are again a little more uh, prescriptive in nature in Article 3, but the actual requirements for a local agency to establish those objectives and thresholds, how that's measured, the density and location of monitoring wells, all of that is much more flexible in articles, uh, sub-articles uh, 3, 4, and 5, including the projects within Article 5 plan content of the regulations. Um, so just, just so folks are aware, we have a lot of really uh, quality questions coming in. We aren't going to have enough time to really drill through all of the clarifying questions. Um, I do want to uh, keep moving along, though. As a follow-up, uh, since you did mention Article 5, um, this question came in. With respect to Article, Article 5, are there provisions in the DWR review process um, or provisions for the review of potential conflicts of interest regarding GSAs, the GSP, unique conditions. Uh, I guess uh, in re with unique conditions regarding planning and development of goals for the basin. Um, they offer an example: director on GSAs uh, own land in basin plans for urbanization. So. I think we've heard similar uh, comments to this at the previous public meetings um, about potential of conflict of interest for GSAs and uh, owning of, of the properties they're managing. Yeah, I, you know, we, we can't really speak to that. Our, our role here in the draft regulations is, is specifically to evaluate the technical um, adequacy towards a GSA's ability to develop and implement a plan that achieves sustainability. Um, in something I didn't mention previously, but our role is very limited in terms of GSA-related uh, um, requirements. The uh, department's role is specifically to, to um, uh, as I mentioned, um, post GSA formation notifications we receive and um, to evaluate those notica notifications uh, for completeness. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure I understand all of your question, to be honest, but, but that specifically sounds a little more uh, GSA-centric and um, something we, pro we 
we likely can't answer here. Yeah. So uh, uh, a more detailed question, specific article uh, 354.8A5, density of wells per square mile reporting. What is the purpose of this and what does CWR have to assist in preparing this data? Yeah, this is a good question and a common comment we've been receiving. And the purpose of this requirement is that to have an understanding of where groundwater is being used in these basins. And so with the idea of if you know where groundwater is being used, you can manage it effectively. And so what the department plans to assist in this area is the department will have um, a summary of, of wells in, in our database for each section in the state. And we plan to be working towards putting that on an interactive map and making it easily available uh, for GSAs and local agencies to use in developing their GSPs. Um, so an, an, another question pertaining specifically to the regulation, uh, number 354.44, projects and management actions. Could a description of the impact on the interests of beneficial uses and users of the groundwater in the basin be included in the description of each project or management action? You know, here in, in, in projects and, and actions, we're looking for the projects and actions that agencies will uh, implement in order to achieve sustainable groundwater management. So the, that's kind of the core objective of that uh, section is to see that obviously these agencies have a plan in terms of developing projects and actions that will likely achieve sustainable groundwater management. Um, really the, the, the relationship to the effects on beneficial uses and users as it's written now in the draft emergency regulations is described in the sustainable groundwater management criteria, or that sub-article 3 within Article 5 of, of plan content. So that's where that uh, resides uh, within the draft regulation. I'm sorry, which one? Um, sorry, we're getting a lot of questions trying to throw on. So here's 354.18D identifies information to be provided by DWR. When will this information be available and how will it be provided to each GSA? Yeah, another good question. Um, in some of that we're working on currently and, and hopefully you know the, the majority of that we'll, we'll have together in over the next year or, or year and a half. Um, but the, uh, it would be provided in a couple different ways, mostly uh, through our, our website. Um, or interactive map and, and trying to make it as easy as possible for folks to be able to go in, drill down to their basin, and, and then collect and, and download the data that we uh, mentioned is, is going to be provided there. Uh, and I'll, I'll circle back to GSAs. Um, a follow-up question uh, regarding white spaces. Can private property owners in those white spaces area assemble themselves to become a GSA? If so, how? Yeah, I, I mean, GSA formation that's specifically in Chapter 4 of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And there are some specific um, requirements in terms of who's eligible to be a GSA. So I would encourage uh, you to go there to look at GSA eligibility. Okay. Um, are there any standards related to choosing the base period which sustainable yield over a long-term condition is defined? Yeah, uh, that was a, a requirement the department had to provide a, uh, the assumptions and methods used to, to define baseline conditions for um, water demands and supplies and, and reliability. And for that, it, it's covered it pretty much in the, uh, in the water budget section. And for that, we're having folks look at their last 10 years of supply reliability their um, current uh, uh, demands and supplies. Uh, so, so I, I you know, reference that section or look to that section for for that information. One moment. Um, I just want to mention that we have ten more minutes. 
to take um, these questions. And we will not be able to get to all of them today, as Kim said. But if you go ahead and submit your questions, then um, we will have record of them, and DWR will be able to consider them. So um, a question regarding alternative plans. Alternatives are due January 1st, 2017, which is before even GSA formation deadline of June 30, 2017. Why are alternatives due first, and when are regular GSPs due? Uh, not on the timeline in the guide. Um, so let's maybe a discussion about how alternatives fit in with GSA formation and GSP development. So yeah, I mean the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act requires that alternatives be submitted to the department by January 1st, 2017. Um, and then, you know, GSPs are due either in 2020 by January 31st, 2020 if they're in a critically overdrafted basin or for all other high and medium priority basins by January 31st, uh, 2022. You know, wh why the legislature um, picked those dates uh, specifically, uh, including the G that alternatives are due before GSA formation, and again, I'm throwing a lot of dates out there, but GSA formation must be done by June 30th, 2017. You know, why the legislature picked those exact dates, I, I honestly don't know. Um, there has been some discussion with local agencies that are thinking about doing an alternative, and there's, again, some specific requirements in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and the regulations, but there are local agencies uh, considering alternatives, um, and they are uh, considering whether or not they should form a GSA, um, because if they're unsuccessful in um, providing an alternative that, that uh, is uh, supported by the department, then they um, they will need to to work towards um, completing a groundwater sustainability plan. But those dates, as it relates to your question, I, I, I'm not exactly sure why those dates were developed uh, at those times. Great. Um, so the new regulations state that technical and financial assistance will be available for preparing the GSPs. When is the money going to be available? How is the money going to be allocated, and what level of local technical assistance will DWR provide to a GSA? You know, those are really good questions, and there's a lot there to potentially discuss. So I'm just going to kind of real quickly highlight kind of things. Um, so there's different there's different ways to answer this. One, you know, I heard technical assistance. So this is assistance that the department will provide local agencies uh, in aiding uh, their development of groundwater sustainability plans. And this is going to come in the form, different forms. Um, the department's uh, working on statewide data sets. Uh, an example might be uh, subsidence data, land use data, uh, other information that will aid local agencies in developing their plans. The department's also uh, providing facilitators uh, uh, through our contract to help with GSA formation and an and item leading up to GSP development. Our regional offices will also be providing technical assistance uh, in the form of support. Uh, you know, it will be limited. Every, it, we have limited resources as, as everyone else, but, you know, support in terms of, of, of being able to, to answer questions as uh, these local agencies develop GSPs. As it relates to funding, you know, there's specific um, fee authority provided uh, to these GSAs as described in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, but there is also some um, state funding that it will possibly be used by local agencies in order to um, uh, help either with the development of these GSPs, so there's Prop 1 funding. Um, that will likely be used. Uh, I think there is between 83 and 86 million remaining of Prop 1 funding that, that, that can be potentially used to aid local agencies in developing their GSPs. The department doesn't have specific timing on that uh, quite yet, but, but we're working on that and should have that out uh, soon in terms of, of the timing of, of when that might be available. There's also other uh, sources of Prop 1 funding uh, that potentially could be used to aid 
local agencies and actually implementing the, their plans. Um, and that funding could include potentially IRWM funding, um, other, other storage and, and, and funding that's a possibility to, to help with that, uh, those implementation of those plans. Great. That's very thorough. There's a lot of information in there. Um, Article 6. Article 6 is on evaluation and assessment of plans. Section 355.4 in particular. Part of the evaluation seeks to ensure that there is adequate financing plan for GSP implementation. Given that the project implementation would not necessarily be funded at that time the GSPs are adopted, and each might require its own Prop 218 process, would DWR simply review the plan, funding mechanism, and timing uh, for reasonableness and recognizing that, the, that it's contingent on landowner approval in the future? Yeah, I mean, so the draft regulations, um, you know, as it's written now, in, in, in I, what we're really interested in is information that shows that the agency has thought through and developed some preliminary approach to funding uh, the, the plan. I think we recognize that, um, you know, it, 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 things will change not only with the finances in terms of how a plan will be implemented, but even the actions and, and you know, the, there's, there's provisions that the plan can be amended, obviously, um, because we recognize that things are going to change greatly over the next 20 years. So, um, you know, what we're interested in is that the agency has uh, some feasibility um, in terms of implementing the plan and so can describe some of the, uh, the approaches that they are going to use to uh, fiscally uh, um, implement the plan. But again, I, I get I'm kind of all over the place. But the, the the point is that we recognize that things will change over time. So I think we're we're down to our last question for the clarifying question phase of our webinar today. Um, and this one's really geared towards kind of the projects uh, that are either currently undergoing or or, or maybe planned as part of a, a future plan. So how is a local agency part of a GSA? going to participate when we are pumping water into an aquifer in an ASR well, for example. Um, what, what, I guess, I'm sorry, as opposed to taking water out of the aquifer, then when we retrieve the water later, do we come under the same rules as others thought uh, as other other participants within the GSA, um, you know, given that they maybe paid for treatment of that water, you know, how does that come into play? So, so, so overall, uh, you know, each GSA in their GSP has to identify their their supplies and demands and their and their overall budget and have to identify um, the recharge location. So clearly, there would be a, a place there um, for you to participate in in with respect to. Uh, explaining what your uh, budget and operations are and, and what the plans would be for, for you know, reversing that ASR to actually extract um, groundwater. So I think there is a place in, in, the, in the plan to, uh, to describe that as far as the budget goes. And, and you know, what I'd add to that, you know, that's, a, that's a very detailed question in terms of how a local agency will implement you know, their plan in order to achieve sustainability. And, and from our perspective, um, again, if I understand the question correctly, I mean, we're out more outcome-based in terms of avoiding those significant and reasonable levels as it relates to those critical parameters uh, over the 20-year implementation horizon. So, you know, really how that's done um, and agreed upon by the local agencies involved in, in implementing either a plan or multiple plans in a basin is, is really left up to the local agencies. Again, i trying to understand the question a little bit, but... Um, it's really, from our perspective, where we're concerned about uh, basin-wide sustainability. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Tim, and thank you all for your questions. That is all the time we have for the question and answer period during this webinar. Uh, we will be moving on to the public comment um, period. So uh, let me go ahead and uh, provide you these instructions again. I went through this at the, the very beginning of the webinar. In order to submit oral comments, uh, 
please follow these instructions. All comments will be made in the order submitted in the question box on your toolbar. You must have entered the audio PIN number on your control panel in order for us to hear you. When you are in the question box, please submit your name, type your name, your affiliation, and a brief topic description, if applicable. If you have a page number or article number to which you're referring, that is also helpful. Um, but it is critical for us to have your name and affiliation at the very least. Um, <clears throat> the department will accept public comment only and will not respond during this period to your comments and, and testimonials. Oral comments should be made to the department, should be relevant to this proposed regulation, GST and all its regulations, and should be professional and respectful. The department will impose a time limit of approximately three minutes. So I will let you know when your time is up. Um, I want to also tell you um, how you can submit your written comments. The department does encourage the submittal of a written copy of your oral testimonial and any supporting evidence, and that needs to be received by April 1, 2016. Um, let me tell you how you can do that. There are various ways to submit your written comments by April 1st by mail, and you can see the information there. You can drop it off um, to the department in Sacramento at the address on your screen. Um, and, oh, and let me, in case someone's not looking at their screen, that's 901 P Street, Sacramento. You can also submit via email at, at the sgmps at water.ca.gov email. And for those of you who have um, may be attending the Sacramento public meeting tomorrow, you can also drop off your, your written um, comments at that time. After the public comment period, again, we're uh, letting you know that that written comment period closes on April 1st. A summary of the public meeting and related exhibits will be a part of the, the department's rulemaking record per Administrative Procedures Act or APA, that's Government Code Section 11340. So um, also, as you know, we will be making this webinar uh, available on the website also. Let's go back. Um, I'm just going to keep those instructions about how to submit your oral comments up on the screen for you to refer to. Um, please, at this time, um, if you would like to, to make public comment, type into your question box your name, affiliation, and if you would like a brief topic description of what you'd like to comment on. And just give us a moment. Okay, hey, thank you for your patience. We've just noticed that some people who want to make comments have not entered their audio pin into the telephone. So please go ahead and look at your webinar toolbar and under audio you'll see that it says telephone and it gives you the number, the access code, and then there is a pin number, an audio pin number. And you need to have you need to put that in in order for us to hear you. Thank you. You need to put your um, yeah. You need to put your audio pin into your telephone. Okay. Um, just to clarify there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We have two comments. Um, Alberto Ramirez from Tigert Materials. Alberto Ramirez from Tyco Tykert Materials. Are you there, Roberto? Alberto, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Well, please make your comment. Thank you. Uh, the uh, 
my main comment is, you know, we we are trying to see how we can regulate, uh, you know, the the basin. My, our concern is that with climate change, uh, this is not going to get any better. So, what is the Department of Water Resources uh, is looking into new uh, reservoirs, localized reservoirs? Uh, in the in the area, and by saying localized reservoirs, uh, the mining companies have huge uh, mining pits that right now, because of uh, regulations, we are uh, covering those pits for reclamation. But one of the ideas throwing out, you know, out there is why don't we move those, uh, why don't we change those mining pits, they are probably anywhere between 100 to 200 acres by 100 to 200 feet in depth into man-made reservoirs to recharge the basin when excess water is being, you know, moved down the system. That's my comment. Thank you very much, Roberto. Um, I believe, uh, is it Kelly McKinney of the city of Roseville? Are you there, Kelly? Okay. Kelly, um, you need to enter in your PIN number so that we're able to, to hear you. So we are going to move on for a moment. Keith Freitas, I believe you need to put in your um, PIN number as well. I see that we're not able to unmute you. Okay. Um, Suzanne Pecci with, um, Suzanne, are you there? Suzanne? Suzanne, are you there? Okay, you need to unmute Suzanne. Suzanne, it looks like we um, we see that we've unmuted you, but it looks like you may be muted. Suzanne, are you there? Okay, um, hold on one moment. Um, okay, thank you very much. Kelly McKinney, we see that she, uh, we've unmuted you. Do you have a comment? Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Go ahead. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Kelly McKinney. I'm the Assistant Environmental and Utilities Director with the City of Roseville. Um, our comment is that we support the statewide goal of sustainably managed groundwater basins and recognize its importance as a foundation to sustainable water supply. We also recognize the challenges faced by the department in crafting balanced regulations and the need for prescription in order to acquire details for each basin statewide. Um, we'd like to note that the draft regulations will require considerable effort regardless of basin health to be completed in the format that's required in these regulations. More specifically, the draft regulations do not recognize existing agency efforts and investments in effectively managing local groundwater resources. We don't see that there's relief in the, in the regulations from the level of effort by those existing management agencies whose basins are stable. Essentially, it's a one-size-fits-all program. We would request that DWR create the regulations that allow for less level of effort if the basins have been managed sustainably over the last 10 years. For example, maybe a minimum GSP level for groundwater sustainability agencies where the groundwater levels have remained stable in 90% of the CASGEM wells 
over the last 10 years, um, reporting being 2004 through 2014. Perhaps a moderate uh, GSP level for GSAs where groundwater levels have been stable uh, between 2004 to 2010 that may be declined through the drought period. And then a full GSP level for groundwater agencies where groundwater levels have declined through the entire 10-year period. So we'd like um, DWR to consider more of a tiered approach and recognize um, agencies and areas that have already been managing their basin. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Keith Freitas. Keith, we've unmuted you. Are you there, Keith? Yes. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, so how, how, do the, how does the public know that the state is actually implementing their, uh, is protecting their rights? For example, how, how, how has the state designed the system, number one, that's a, that's, that's a non-lobbied and totally free of, of, uh, um, of conflict of interest by having a statewide managed aquifer. In other words, how can you manage a statewide aquifer if you don't balance all the water in the state first? So the water, the water has to be balanced. It has to be available all the components of that amount of water from the north end of the state to the south end of the state to the central portion of the state have to be balanced. Otherwise, you can't, you, you can't, you can't design a plan that's fair to, to, uh, to all of its people and users. Um, and how, how does the state, and, and I know these are questions you can't answer, but this is a comment, uh, Germany has, uh, scientists in Germany have proved that with the global warming, you're basing a lot of the um, a, a lot of the state's water management plans uh, on the fact that we do have global warming, and since you're an environmental group, um, you would think that you have to, you you would build into build into the regulatory provisions of this of this plan that the rising water the rising seawater levels are are going to totally um, eliminate any capacity that, that a statewide system would have to manage those intrusions of salt water back into the delta system. And so I don't see how you could possibly uh, present a program that doesn't include the potential for rising, uh, rising seawater levels, rising sea levels, and uh, without having that uh, a part of that component being a damming system that dams uh, seawater from, uh, from the uh, uh, from the Delta intrusion uh, tributaries. Excuse me, Keith. So we have we do have a three minute limit today. So if you could wrap up your comments, please. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, and so yeah, that's what I would like to ask the state to do is in, to include to the to include for the public how the public's use interest is protected. How does this state water system protect the public from conflict of interest, even at the local level? at the regional level and at the state level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. Our, um, Suzanne um, Petschi, we um, have unmute you. Suzanne, are you there? Yes. Thank you. Please make your comment. Um, as a domestic well order owner, I have been to um, two meetings in my area um, that are with, with respect to water districts uh, exploring becoming a GSA and um, I'm just wondering um, I'm, I'm, I feel that the information that was given out was very limited at the meetings and the effort for public outreach was also limited um, in the last meeting I went to there was only one public meeting held and then the decision to go forward was to be made the next morning at a board meeting um, I'm wondering how much of a role will evidence of public outreach and public comment that will be provided in the, the uh, groundwater sustainability plan be looked at by DWR with respect to the adequacy of the plan and the outreach? Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for your comments. 
Um, Greg Meyer with the City of Woodland. Give us a moment, Greg. We're going to unmute you. Okay, Greg, are you there? I'm there. Yeah, this is Greg Meyer from the City of Woodland. I'm concerned that the uh, substantial details of the emergency regulations are going to replace uh, requirements on the GSAs that are not necessary, not needed, and in fact will drive up the cost, the time, the effort required to conform to the rules that really are overly prescriptive. It's that one-size-fits-all that Roseville was talking about that really concerns me. Uh, it, it seems like the requirements that have been put into this emergency regulation uh, are uh, off the chart when you compare it to what was actually in the Groundwater Management Act. So uh, I'm concerned that it, it, this is a, a far overreaching uh, document that's uh, it's gone too far and I'm concerned the the proscriptive nature of the document is going to lose the uh, uh, the local control nature of what the original intent of the act was thank you thank you very much Greg I don't see any other um, commenters here so I'm going to put out a last Call. If you would like to make a comment, please go ahead and put your name and your affiliation into your question box. I'll give you just a moment to see if we have anyone else who would like to comment. Okay, we, I see that Keith Freitas, you have another comment. Just um, please go ahead, and we do have a three-minute limit. Give us a second, Keith. Go ahead, Keith. Keith okay, Freitas. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't identify myself. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a grower, so I guess I, I would be considered a farmer. And I'm uh, wondering how the state and environmental agency of the State Water Board plans to protect the sustainability of small family farms uh, under this uh, under this uh, emergency regulation and under the code itself and under the act itself. Thank you, Keith. Okay, I do not see any other comments. Just going to pause for a moment to see if anyone else would like to put your name and your affiliation into the comment box. We'll give you just a few seconds before we then wrap up today's webinar. Okay, thank you all for, for oh, looks like, did we get someone? Okay. Okay, Rocky Vogler, uh, we're unmuting you now. Rocky, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, it's it's actually a bit of a question. We have the webinar scheduled until 3 p.m., and if there's no more public comments, I was wondering if we could use the additional time between now and 3 o'clock to continue uh, asking, clarifying questions, and getting responses from DWR. Thanks. Thank you very much. Give us a moment, Rocky.
Thank you for that question, Rocky. We just wanted to discuss it here um, among the DWR staff members. Um, that's a very good suggestion. What we'd like to do, because we really can't bounce back and forth between the, the public comment, the official public comment period and questions, so we want to ensure that all the, um, everyone who would like to make a public comment has had the opportunity to do so, and then we will officially close the public comment period and then spend the remainder of the time on your questions. So we do have um, another comment from Suzanne Pesci. Suzanne, are you there? Yes, I am. Go ahead. Well, I wanted to follow up on a previous caller with regard to conflict of interest, um, with regard to the board of directors on uh, on a GSA, and um, and and the potential for uh, the conflict with respect to um, the goals and plans for the particular region or area that the basin is in uh, regarding urbanization of that area. Um, and I'm just hoping that that will be touched on with respect to the makeup of, of the board. Um, there is no requirement that domestic well owners or environmentalists or people with other interests um, than the um, farmers that usually make up the board of directors on many of these GSAs. Um, and I think that um, in looking at the plans for the um, GSAs, that the public input and public comment should be part of what you are looking for and the adequacy of that, too, so that domestic well owners are not lost in this whole process. Um, you put out uh, flyers that state that there are more than two million domestic well owners in in the state, and there are no provisions that there is any mandatory seat on the board for them. And um, I, I have a problem with that. So if that can be addressed, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm just pausing for a moment because I don't see um, any other. Uh, anyone else uh, requesting to make a comment? But as I said before, we will we will officially close the comment period before we open it again for questions. So I'm just going to um, make a long pause here. Okay, we um, Trevor has has told me that we would like to just wait um, for until 2:30. We're going to wait just five minutes. If there are any other comments, we are going to keep the comment period open for those five minutes. Um, if we don't have any more comments, we're just we're we're going to be uh, it'll be quiet for five minutes, but then we'll start up the question and answer period again. Um, again, we are still during the um, we are in the middle of the public comment period. We will close the comment uh, public comment period at 2:30. We see that some of you have questions that uh, um, we will address during the question and answer period. So, if anyone would like to make public comment, it will remain open for four more minutes.
Hello, just a reminder that we're still in the middle of the public comment period, which will close at 2.30. So go ahead and stand by. Starting at 2.30, we will open up the question and answer, question for clarification again. Thank you. Just a reminder, if you would like to make a public comment in the next couple of minutes, you should write your, your name and your affiliation in the question box. Please do that now, as the public comment period will only remain open for a couple more minutes. Thank you. Again, pu the public comment period will remain open for one more minute. If you would like to make a public comment, enter your name and affiliation in your question box. Thank you. It will remain open for one more minute. Okay, thank you. The public comment period is now officially closed, and we will open up uh, for more questions. We're going to go back to the way we, we did it earlier in the webinar. Um, everyone is going to be muted. We will not be taking any questions on the, on the phone line. If you have a question that you would like DWR to respond to related to the GSP and ALT regulations only, Please submit your question in your question box, and DWR staff um, will respond. Go ahead. Tim is going to be um, fielding your questions now. Okay. So um, the questions, the clarifying questions that we have uh, up front, I might as well utilize as piggyback to the comments that were made. This one is specifically regarding the eligibility of private well owners uh, on a GSA board. 
if any clarification in terms of how private can engage with GSAs or what is the role of the GSA with regard to private? Yeah, you know, that, that's a question really that I can't answer. Um, the, uh, the, the specific GSA you know, requirements and how a GSA uh, operates, uh, you know, the, their future any governance structure is really not within the, uh, the department's uh, purview. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, we cannot answer that question. Okay. Um, uh, we had a, a question earlier, and I'd like to jump back up to that. And it's uh, a question regarding uh, current low priority basins. Sorry, I'm trying to find it very quickly here. Uh, for very low and low priority basins, whenever they submit their GSP, it will automatically pass the first criteria of evaluation because there is no timeline uh, for submission, i.e. 2020 or 2022 deadlines. Secondly, if a basin changes from a very low to, or from a low or very low to a medium or a high, it will have will it have an equal amount of time um, to prepare GSPs uh, prior to the the pass fail um, evaluation phase. Right, and, and so if, if as far as the second part of that question goes, if their um, priority changes after January 31st of, uh, I believe it's uh, 2017, then they will get an extra two years um, and five years. So they'll get an extra five years to, um, uh, from the time of uh, the date of the reprioritization to meet the requirements of the uh, plan, and they get another two years uh, to, to uh, form a GSA for that area. And for the first part of the question about the low and very low Priority basins as far as state evaluation, Water Code Section 10720.7b states that Chapter 11 of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act does not apply to low and very low priority basins, which means, and that's the chapter that explains state intervention. So state intervention does not apply to low and very low priority basins. And then, uh, just in response to the previous question about a GSA, a private well owner and a GSA board, I just, uh, what I can point you to is again Chapter 5 of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Uh, you may want to look at that chapter and specifically, uh, 10725, I believe it is, uh, as it relates to your question. Okay. Um. So uh, a question that kind of revolves apparently around watershed versus groundwater basin. What level of responsibility will out of watershed areas have in managing the underflow traveling into adjacent GSA regulated water basins? How will this be articulated in a GSP? Yeah. That's a little tricky. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one because uh, you know typically if you're in a different watershed, you're not going to have underflow um, going to an adjacent basin. If, if you're if they're referring to the fact of uh, just adjacent basins and the underflow um, between those, um, the, the regulations you know, state that the um, that that you know your your uh, your actions that you take to achieve sustainability in, in, in one basin can affect the uh, ability of the other basin to achieve sustainability. So to really be judged on that and make in making sure that that there aren't impacts or, or impediments to uh, achieving sustainability in adjacent basins. Um, just a point of clarification: uh, the team responding to these comments are Trevor, Trevor Joseph, Dan McManus, and Stephen Springhorn. Um, uh, that was a request there. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, how will an alternative be evaluated? Uh, section 358.6 states it will be evaluated for consistency, consistency with Article 6, but Article 6 is for a plan. If an alternative is evaluated just like a plan, what's the point of allowing an alternative? Well, uh, the 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 alternative 
really has the same goal as the GSP overarching goal in that uh, an alternative either needs to point the analysis that the basin is already operating to a sustainable yield, which is, is avoiding undesirable results, or there's an existing groundwater plan, management plan or a new adjudication that will, will achieve that same goal of avoiding undesirable results. So when we develop the draft regulations, um, essentially there's that same goal. And so that evaluation criteria from our perspective uh, seem to be um, as applicable to a GSP as a, an alternative. And with the substantial evaluation criteria, kind of that adequacy criteria, maybe I'll add that uh, you know we've we've heard comments that some perceive that as substantial completeness, meaning that uh, uh, you know they need to adhere to only a certain number of those evaluation criteria. That is. That is false in terms of how we set that up. It's not uh, if you're, you're satisfactory in our eyes with a nine out of 11 or a certain percent. That, that's not how that works. We still need to see complete plans in terms of how that's currently constructed. But the substantial evaluation criteria, the adequacy criteria, allows us uh, to, to use some objectiveness in terms of looking at the plan. We recognize each of these plans is going to be unique. And it, they will approach these requirements in different ways uh, and achieve uh, sustainability differently. And so there is no one size fits all in terms of you know, a specific water level for a specific basin uh, from a statewide approach. And so we've designed that criteria in order to make an adequacy evaluation of looking at the entire plan. Uh, so it, it, it is you know, a, a objective use of the department's discretion as it relates to that criteria. Um, so so that, that's kind of the design of, of that um, evaluation section. Great, thanks. What's the plan for dealing with rising seas? And how will that impact the delta and ecosystem? Yeah, so, so how it's going to impact the delta and ecosystem is, is kind of beyond the scope of, of, of this, but as, as far as the plans go, how they'll address sea level rise, um, the plans are required to, uh, you know, we're looking at your projected water budget over the uh, planning implementation horizon to take into account um, both climate level rise. And once again, the department is trying to uh, provide information um, on both of those aspects so people will have a, a better clarification, understanding what to expect as far as what we anticipate for sea level rise over the next 50 years. Okay. And, and I guess there was, um, so Steve Baker had kind of a clarification about, um, you know, the, uh, the, the watershed, uh, 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 and I just wanted to follow up on that, about the uh, interaction between um, basins out of the watershed, and his, his clarification was what if, you know, Central Valley Aquifer is being recharged by the Sierras, and, and that would really fall under part of the water budget requirements, is to be able to identify the underflow uh, coming into the basin. So, and then, oh, go ahead. Well, and then another requirement is in the description of the basin or basin setting. There's a description of recharge areas for the basin as well. Right. That could come into play. Great. Thanks for the follow-up. Um, another question. Uh, the future formation of GSA statewide will be radically affected if DWR cannot provide guidance on who is eligible to form a GSA. Now, ultimately, it will ultimately fracture the potential process of coordinating between agencies. Why can't DWR provide that guidance? Yeah, so, you know, this, uh, this point is really um, exceeds our uh, authority in, in provided in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. As I briefly mentioned, our, our role as defined in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is really summarized as is receiving these GSA formation notifications, posting that information on our, our website, uh, and again, we've developed tools so that local agencies can use a map interface to really see, um, you know, visually, obviously, where these GSAs are formed, and then we have a completeness evaluation, and what is meant by that is that 
uh, as required in Chapter 4, these local agencies when submitting these notifications need to provide a series of, of items. And so we need to make sure that we receive uh, those items as part of the notification. So yeah, that, that, that what you described in your question, uh, Mr. Vogler, it exceeds our authority as described in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Okay, so uh, will the GSP sustainability goals supersede county general plans at times? How can this conflict be resolved in the GSP? Um, you know, that there are requirements in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act as it relates to a GSA. Uh, you know, uh, contacting uh, land use planning agencies and just, you know, providing GSP information um, and to describe how, how land use plans uh, in the regulations, how um, the GSP is, uh, it, sorry, a description of land use plans should, is a requirement in the GSP and how those land use plans um, might uh, be uh, uh, oh, uh, um, what am I trying to say? How those land use plans impact the ability to to reach sustainability? Uh, so you know, there's this need for certainly coordination between these GSAs and land use uh, agencies. If they're not, the, the GSA is not the land use agency uh, it, it itself. Um, but I can't speak to whether or not you know a, a one plan supersedes another. Great. Um, so, uh, a specific regulatory question, section 358.4C, can you clarify what are the different types of alternative plants? So, I guess kind of what the, the regulation stipulates uh, the, I guess, a variety of means to comply with uh, or to utilize and exercise an alternative plan. Yeah, so really the, the types of alternative plans are provided in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So it's Water Code 10733.6 uh, uh, describes alternative submittals. And I'm reading here, an alternative submittal can be any of the following. One is a plan developed pursuant to Part 2.75. And uh, what that means uh, is essentially an existing uh, groundwater management plan. And then it says, or other law authorizing groundwater management. So that's one item. An alternative can be an existing groundwater management plan. Um, the, an alternative can also be management pursuant to an adjudicated action. So that's an adjudicated action that's that's not listed in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So you could think of that perhaps as a new adjudication. And then the third one is this analysis that the basin, uh, analysis of basin conditions that demonstrates the basin has operated within a sustainable yield for a period of 10 years. And this uh, needs to be signed off by a professional engineer or a geologist who's registered. So there's those three options. Again, I'll paraphrase, essentially existing groundwater management plan, adjudication, or this analysis that the basins operate to sustainable yield. But there are some additional requirements here. One, again, looking at the requirements specifically in the regulations, um, the requirement that the whole basin or sub-basin is covered by this alternative. And then in order to submit an alternative, a local agency needs to be uh, compliant with uh, the CASGEM requirements uh, defined uh, by uh, the water code in the department. Um, so that's alternatives kind of at a glance. So we, we have a, a question that was emailed in and it is uh, specifically pertaining to adjudicated areas within um, basins. So a geographical part of a basin listed in the Groundwater Sustainability Act is adjudicated. The act is inapplicable to the listed basin 
However, not all private pumpers have pumping volumes quantified, limited, or restricted. The volume was estimated and figured into the basin management plan to obtain sustainability. The questions are, can this unrestricted private pumping be used to apply the act uh, to apply the act, form a GSA only to cover those private pumpers. Um, and then does the unrestricted part of the total pumping in the basin within an adjudicated area require or trigger a need uh, for a GSA? So I, I think it's really along the lines of how, how do we address um, potentially unnamed parties to the adjudication within adjudicated areas? And then how do we address areas outside of adjudicated areas within a basin? So, um, you know, we've had some discussion with uh, existing adjudications that, that uh, clearly do not cover the entire basin or sub-basin. The adjudication follows the the um, parcels that were described within the uh, I guess the court order or, or the specific requirements of the adjudication, and so those parcels do not line up with the basin boundaries. And what what this has caused in some basins is uh, again the adjudication does not fill in the entire basin or sub basin, and we've called this fringe areas in our prior uh, discussions. Um, so these areas, if they're in high and medium priority basins, and again, they're outside of an adjudication, um, they're still required to be covered uh, in terms of either a GSP or an alternative um, by the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Otherwise, uh, there's potential for state board intervention. So entities that uh, comprise uh, these areas, meaning um, local agencies or counties uh, are considering their options in terms of whether or not to try to submit an alternative to cover these fringe areas and the basin um, or to develop a GSP, form a GSA and develop a GSP for these, these, these small areas outside of an adjudication. I think we're... Uh running near the bottom of our clarifying questions. Um, and if anybody has any additional uh, questions that we can help clarify with regards to the regulation and how it would be applied, I think uh, that would be a good opportunity.
So thank you. We're getting a lot of questions on GSA formation, which is not a surprise. I know that's, uh, that's kind of a, a very uh, topic of a lot of interest. I, I just want to point out this call, though, is specifically to talk through GSP emergency regulations and the department's scope uh, as it relates to those regulations is, is fairly clear in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. We need to evaluate the, uh, these groundwater sustainability plans implementation of these plans, coordination agreements, um, and, uh, and so obviously these draft regulations includes the information uh, we feel that is necessary at this time to evaluate uh, those requirements. Although GSA formation is certainly a part of the greater Sigma implementation, um, a lot of the GSA formation uh, topic exceeds uh, the department's uh, current scope uh, to uh, to address, so um, we'll try to uh, get to some of the uh, GSP-related questions here with our remaining time, and then we'll wrap things up. So just, uh, we see one question here, um, you know, what triggers state board intervention um, as it relates to the, the, the regulations? The, the state board intervention is really um, the state board's purview in terms of, you know, what potentially, its potential intervention. There are some deadlines in Sigma that are, were identified on our guide in that bottom bar. Um, for example, by June 30th, 2017, you know, GSAs uh, must form in high and medium priority basins, and then July 1st, the county has the option of um, uh, being pursued the GSA if no other local entity uh, fills uh, in those white spaces or the basin. Uh, that is a potential uh, offer to do or, or, or possibility for state board intervention. The other ones, as described in the slides previously, the pass-fail criteria, if we do not receive plans uh, by the 2020 or 2022 deadline, those are also potential uh, opportunities for state board intervention. You know, what that will look like potentially, how the board uh, may potentially uh, get involved uh, is really described in um, Chapter 11 of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So if you're interested in that topic, I encourage you to read through Chapter 11. And then also contact the State Water Resources Control Board um, for additional information um, on, on, on what that process could potentially look like. Other um, thoughts on the GSA eligibility item, as I mentioned, really exceeds in large part our scope. The uh, eligibility questions can be sent to the State Water Resources Control Board. Um, I think the, the web or the email address is groundwater underscore management at waterboards.ca.gov. Um, so you know, the State Board has uh, uh, the uh, uh, can potentially help with some aiding some of the uh, those questions. So we're, we're nearing the end of our time, and this will be our last question for the clarifying um, opportunity. We'll close up with some uh, additional thoughts. But um, the question came in regarding Section 352.7 of Article 3, 
um, will technical documents be made available to the public? The answer is yes. So when we receive information from the GSAs as they submit their GSPs, we'll be posting that on our website. So the information we're provided will be posted and publicly available on the department's website. Okay. Thank you all for your questions. Um, Trevor has just some closing remarks. Yeah, so again, thank you for taking the time to uh, one, engage with us in questions and answers, but also giving us public comments. Um, you know, the department is committed to developing a draft emergency regulation that obviously results in sustainable groundwater management, but at the same time, we want a, a workable regulation, uh, and we're looking to potentially make some revisions uh, again, as long as it meets our legislative uh, requirements. And so this information really is imperative to help us think through uh, any potential changes or revisions that uh, we will uh, make uh, before um, we go for uh, adoptions. So I want to thank you again for that. And then finally, um, tomorrow is our last uh, public meeting. It will be here in Sacramento at the Secretary of State building at 9 a.m. And uh, at that point, we uh, will have close out our public meeting. And then, uh, again, comments, written comments are due uh, by the uh, April 1st. And uh, information to submit written comments uh, is provided on the uh, slide in front of you. Um, and also provided on our website. And we encourage you, if you have uh, any specific uh, or general, but, but obviously written comments are really valuable. If you have some specific comments or word changes or suggestions, uh, there really is a little substitute for that. So we encourage you to provide us any written comments. Uh, but again, we thank you for your oral comments today. Thank you all. And again, the, a recording of this webinar will be made available at the Sustainable Groundwater Management Program website in the coming days. Thank you again.